there's so much to do There's hula, there's surfing and real estate too We're just two local guys with so much to say So listen to the Real Estate Brothers today everyone welcome to episode 25 of the real estate brothers um this is your march edition uh we haven't we're, we haven't gone uh, in person live for a few months so we're at home so hopefully you're tuning in via the zoom um attachment that we sent or you're tuning into facebook i think we're in, on uh, my personal facebook live post if you guys uh, have trouble with the zoom today we're Got some a lot of good content for you as usual. Hopefully, you folks enjoy. So, we'll just start off. Um, we are actually a day early from getting the February Oahu statistics. So, I've decided to have uh, some other content first, starting off with, I guess, the big elephant in the room. That's why we're at home, right? And not right. out. <laughs> exactly. Trying to, trying to stay, yeah, stay healthy. No, no more um, ma- manly uh, handshakes with the chest bump. It's all about the, the corona. F- uh, fist pumps nowadays, right? What is that? I don't know if you notice, but like go around now and do the fist pump with the outside of your hands versus the big sh- handshake. Okay. I've been seeing that a lot more recently because it's more sanitary and you're not passing around the, the germs, right? Because that's how COVID-19 theoretically goes around is through your hand and then you touch your, your mouth or your nose. Oh, it's like one of those office jokes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's, it's prevalent now because you can pass it to your aerosol to you know people sneezing and stuff but um, a lot of it's you know hand to mouth hand to nose so that's why they say you know just be careful so uh, to me this is the biggest thing is that, like i said the elephant in the room is so many so much news popping up and so it's constantly changing every day um i find it really interesting personally and how it's affecting you know the stock market and just even everyday life right and i think tuesday uh fed chair reduced the uh, Fed rate by 50 basis points, right, as a proactive measure to um, give um, everyone assurance that the government's going to be taking an active role. But I don't know if you were watching, Lane, but it it actually had a a negative effect on the stock markets uh, short term. So that day, I think it freaked out the market because they're like, wow, you're you're going 50 basis points, not, not 25. So it, it kind of shocked the market. So I, was, I thought that was kind of interesting or it, it had, a, I think, a reverse effect on what everyone thought. And then, not to get political, but uh, Joe Biden did really well, right, on Tuesday. I think he did well on the polls. And then the market did well after that because that was a good sign for, I think, the healthcare side because I think what they're saying is Bernie is not – his plan is is not really good for for the healthcare industry. So all these kind of interesting things. I don't know if you heard, Lane, but I've heard um, rumors that um, Kim Jong-un, so today he he wrote a letter of condolence to South Korea, but somebody was telling me that, and again, this is just total buzz and probably fake news, but they're telling me that North Korea, if there's anyone they found out that had the virus, they, they just shoot them on the spot. I mean, there's nothing to laugh about, <laughs> but I just was chipping out because I guess North Korea is claiming that they have no cases of the virus. Uh, I'm kind of interesting. I th- find that really interesting. Like all the statistics, right? They said it's 2% uh, mortality rate, but like they just weren't testing people, right? For a while because yeah. they would had a shortage of tests. Yeah. And now they're starting to actually test people. So right. obviously... Like in the beginning, it'd be like, yeah, Dean, you have, we, obviously we know you have coronavirus. Let's get you tested. Right. But right. Whereas now they're going to start to test everybody since they actually have the test kits. Right. So like in China, supposedly they've been testing since January. And I think today they're saying they, they may be at a peak. So that's that's a good sign. So I think the, actually the China markets did well. Um, like you said, as of three three days ago, I have that note right there on YouTube that New York City ER doctor was saying that they still couldn't test because like you said, mentioned Lane, I think the CDC had produced a bunch of test kits and then they retracted them and said, no, no, wait, wait, wait we got to adjust those. So it's only as of recent that we've been starting testing, I think even in Hawaii. Yeah? Like you said, there's 
in my mind, I'm, I'm sure it's it's here. It's just we have no way to prove that last five percent to confirm, right? Yeah. Anyway, I mean, these things are happening, and you hear, see all those social media posts. You go to Costco, no toilet paper, no water. I went uh, last week, and for some reason, there was no detergent. The t- detergent was wiped out. I was, was kind of thought that was interesting. Or, or bleach, right? I mean, yeah, it's... yeah. Well, I went yesterday and th- there was a lot of um, Clorox, but yeah, those 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 wipes, those Clorox wipes were were gone. Kind of think it's like one of the symptoms is like diarrhea, right? That's why all the toilet paper is all gone or something. Like that. <laughs> no, it's like a hurricane. I think, no, I think everyone's going into hurricane preparedness mode um, because that's what we are most familiar with, yeah. So, like, even for me, I was looking, and this is bad, but I was looking for Vienna sausage <laughs> and long set of sale. I went to Milani Town. I went to Mililani, close to my house, and also went to, I was out in Hawaii Kai for a client meeting, and all three were wiped out. So, kind of interesting. Um, also, it's affecting here locally, right? Like you said, we don't have any confirmed cases, but this coming um, Honolulu Festival this weekend, they... Earlier on, they canceled the fireworks, and just uh, yesterday or the day before, they canceled the actual parade. So, uh, when when things like this happen, to me, we we need to take a step back, right, and look at things in terms of our investments for one, either real estate, stock, or whatever, and, and just and look at in life in general, and in terms of putting things into perspective, right. So, on the next slide, Lane, if you will see. We're talking, oh, sorry, the timeline. Oh, so it's funny, interesting about how this is how it started setting up. And there's everything is constantly changing, right? And we get new information every, every day, right? It's, find it in, in Europe and then well, first in Asia, then now in Europe and now we're in the States and how the rates. But I just wanted to put that as perspective. Cause that, yesterday, California enacts the state of emergency, right? So right. they do that because now they can get federal funding, right? They know how to play the game. <laughs> Right, right, right. So just a reminder for people like, for the next slide, I just like, yeah, keep calm, take a step back. And we we talk about too, for investors, they always, they always say, you know, don't do what everyone else is doing, right? So in my mind, I mean, don't go buy five packs of toilet paper and all that water, but that's one thing. But even on the investment side, right, maybe now is the time to take action because a lot of people are getting scared and Let's, let's wait and see. With that said, I tried to have that mindset and try to do what others are doing. So what I did is in January, I took a look at, and this is just one uh, piece of my portfolio, is I looked at uh, my 401k or what's sitting in my current 401k. If you look, take a look at it. Um, so it was a diversified portfolio. Yeah, you know, I have like 30% in large cap, you know, 30%, 25%. 35% in mid cap and small cap by another 30%. And then money market, I have 5%. So around January, I think 27th is was when I actually made that call. I said, I'm going to cash out. So, and again, this is just a, a, a piece of my the portfolio, but what was sitting in my old employer's uh, 401k, I, I cashed out and I, I made that call to, um, Take a, take a risk and, and try to do what I'm, I'm thinking others are not doing. So having that mindset, trying again to keep calm, take a step back and do not do what others are doing, but trying to think for myself. With that said, I also wanted to bring up association fees. I think the last two episodes, we, we talked a bunch about association fees and uh, what they stand for, the ch- trend of them to always go up because, you know, the cost to do business has been going up. So I'm happy to, to say I actually found an association that the fees, monthly fees actually dropped by 13% for 2020. And uh, <laughs> this is my, my investment actually in, in, in Las Vegas. So it's, it's a small, I think it's a two bedroom uh, one bath walk up in uh, Northwest uh, Las Vegas. So we, we went from two forty nine dollars a month uh, to two sixteen. So it's a thirteen percent drop. So there's um, there's a hope for for association fees. They don't always have to go up. I guess is my point. Better sell it though. It's probably gonna go back <laughs> up. Uh, that's, yeah, that's the thing. Like the people that run those HOAs are usually they're not professionals, right? It's just a bunch of people who have kind of been voluntold into those positions depends like to your point yeah on the board it's a lot of it's all the owners you know some of our some of them are um 
owner occupants, others are investors. But a lot of times, they are on the board, like you said, or um, it, it can be, it's just anyone who lives there or owns that can sit on the board. But hopefully the association management is run by like a property management company. Like uh, locally, we have like a lot of it's a Hoyana or Socia. So to your point though, on the board, you, you have, it runs a full gamut. A lot of times it's owners who are angry that the fees have been going up historically and they want to make a change, right? So they say, oh, I'm going to get on the board. And, uh, and a lot of times they see, they find out, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's tough trying to keep these costs down. But anyway, I wanted to talk next about, I call this the J1 inspection corner. So the J1 uh, is a term on the purchase contract, on the residential purchase contract um, in Hawaii. And that allows the buyer the opportunity to do a professional inspection and use that to negotiate um, either repairs or credits. So I just wanted to educate the our listeners about what a GFCI is, which stands for ground fault circuit interrupter. So typically these are installed nowadays to code it. Um, I think if you're six feet away from a water source, then you need to have this interrupter there. And basically what it does is um, it'll cut off the power if um, say you're, you're touching it and you know, you're grounded to a water source. So basically reducing injury and, and potentially death. The reason why I want to bring this up is you, you often see in the professional inspections that they test these GFCIs to ensure that they're working. Knowing, understanding what these are is, is important, but my next tip is to make sure that although you, you understand what these are and you know what they look like in that picture, that um, basically we want to keep keep it to the professionals, right? So a situation that, that happened to me in a recent transaction was that we had the J1 inspection performed, you know, and my buyer paid a ins- inspector to take a look. So one thing they do is they plug that into the uh, and they check. Here we go. Thank you. So leave it to the pros. So they they test the GFCIs to make sure that they're working. Um, and so our inspection report stated that we had four out of the five um, interrupters in the kitchen weren't working. We used the inspection report. I sent it over to the seller's agent and let them know that um, you know we our request was to get these repaired and fixed because that's a safety issue. So what happened was my, the seller's agent went in and he bought or he owned one of these um, GFCI outlet testers, what you see on screen in, in red. And he went in and he started plugging in into the outlets and they lit up and he even sent me a video and he said, look, look, I plug it in, it, it works, it works. He's like, yeah, these, these work, uh, we're, we're not going to replace it. So, um, and this is via text. And so I told him, yeah, you know, I, I didn't say leave it up to the pros or anything, but I just let them know. It's like, no, it's, it's not that there's no electricity running through the outlets. It's that the the ground fault interrupter is not working properly. So um, he then went back and said, okay, let me get back to you. And um, the happy to say that they ended up doing that repairs prior to close. But my point is, yeah, you know, we should definitely leave it up to the pros because, you know, we – we may know what we're doing. If we buy this $10 tool, we can say, oh yeah, you know, it's working, but I leave, leave it to them to do. And, you know, you stay in your wheelhouse because that's potential risk. And not to say, I mean, the, the seller's agent was, was trying to do what he thought was best for his client, which, which is great. But um, with that said, I, I think know what's in your wheelhouse and stick to, to what, what you do best. And I mean, of course, we're always trying to look out for our client and um, try to think of doing what's, what's best. But yeah, stick into, stay, stay in your lane, I guess is my point. Yeah. So yeah, it reminds, that's, reminds me when I was like a city engineer and everybody thinks that they are a traffic engineer because they drive a <laughs> car, right? <laughs> Why are the lights going off at this yeah, time? You should, put the, you should put it like this. You make a lane right here. Like, All right, man. Oh. so if you guys want to learn more about uh, passive cash flow on the mainland um, check out my podcast simple passive cash flow on itunes and uh, dean and i run a local investing group at reialoha.com join our meetup and facebook group Um, you guys need access to that let dean or myself know but i'm going to kind of quickly go through some of the headlines that i've collected over the past month 
Um, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, Dean, you know, maybe you want to zig when everybody's zagging, right? Like <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to Disneyland in a couple of weeks when the coronavirus is happening. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited because hopefully everybody is, is afraid and I can actually ride the Star Wars, right? <laughs> Yeah. So, but you know, what is, what is always said in this situation, right? What does your financial yeah. planner always say? Oh, you have to, Dean, you gotta, you gotta play it for the long run, right? right, right Keep right. your money in, right? Right. We have a well-balanced portfolio. So that's, that's what, what we, we're, the whole plan is to write up these uh, peaks and valleys, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a different thought process. I don't have any stocks or mutual funds. Yep. Mine's, mm-hmm. My money is all in cash flowing real estate. Mm-hmm. where a work for somebody in workforce housing pays rent and yeah. it pays for the expense. So that's just me. Mm-hmm. But um, I think we're all here because we're drinking the Kool-Aid of real estate. Right. Um, so I kind of take it to an extreme a little bit, but yeah. So I think like, what about like a week ago or two weeks ago, the, the Dow dropped a thousand points and it, yeah. and it dropped like a thousand points is huge. Like I remember oh. when 400 to 500 points was a big drop per day. Yeah, 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 and so it dropped a thousand points, which was the quickest six-day fail in history. Since, yeah, quickest ten percent since, decline. Since the was it since oh eight from the subprime, or is it in history? Since um, the speed of decline oh. beat the Black Monday plunge in October nineteen eighty seven. Wow! Oh, even eighty seven is Black Friday. Yeah. Wow. So Black Monday. And then putting things in perspective here, here's kind of a graphical representation of what happened for SARS, which is very similar to coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And it was a sort of a, a knee-jerk reaction where it kind of came come crashing down. And then it actually started to be a sort of a rebound right back up. And that's mm-hmm. why I'm looking at how things are. Mm-hmm. I d- am not one bit concerned about this coronavirus Mm -hmm. Um, it could be wrong right this is how this is where they they put in those uh zombie apocalypse movies right as the land dead man's last words but (laughs) i think this is a show inherit the earth right from where the world's are (laughs) away i think this is um beginning of a little nice breather an excuse Mm. to take a rest and then repower back right through for the election for another few years yeah that was, uh, that's what I was responding to your comment, I think, on the social media. I was like, yeah, I think it's it's an excuse for a correction. Like, And, and like, it's not a, not a huge one, but um, they said it's, it's actually, I mean, it's bigger than SARS already, right? They said that already. So that, that's confirmed. Yeah. Or even like swine flu, right? Like if you listen, if you hear back, or if you kind of put yourself in that perspective, like it came around the summertime and then just dissipated like nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in other news, this is more on the East Coast. Specialty grocery store, Earth Fair, went bankrupt because of a lot of the uh, competition from Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, etc. Hmm. Uh, commercial property executive says the industrial outlook for 2020 to 2021 remains strong. Uh, investors still value dollar stores. And if you guys haven't heard about dollar stores, we don't really have too many of them on in Hawaii. Uh, they're a little bit different on the mainland. Like da- <laughs> it's like Daiso. They have Daiso here. Right? Yeah, not not like <laughs> Daiso. Yeah, Daiso <laughs> is a fun novelty shop where it's, it's, yeah, on the mainland, if you don't have very much money, like you make, 10 grand to 40 grand a year, you typically shop in family dollar um, stores. All right, all right. And there's also like a new store that I thought was a frozen yogurt store called Five and Below. Okay. And I went, when I was in Alabama, I went inside because I wanted Froyo, but it was like a $5 and below store. Oh. These things are super popular on the main. Yeah. 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 But they do well in the recession and they're yeah. kicking, they're really kicking butt now. Mm. Kind of taking off. Hmm. Uh, mortgage rates are at a three-year low, and this is even after the last um, theatrics in the last week or so. Mm-hmm. We we're closing out a hundred. I don't even know how many units. Hundred fifty something units or hundred seventy units. Um, oh, congratulations! We locked in yesterday at three point five percent. Wow. Yeah, 
commercial. Yeah, commercial. So it's a little it, higher it, than residential. That's pretty awesome. That's not SBA though. No, no. Mm. So, and it's just a reminder, right? We're at three year lows. And I think the, the knee jerk reaction that everybody's going to want to do is like go out and refinance. Refi, their, refi, yep. Right. But, you know, that's exactly what the lenders want you to do because they want to collect their origination fees and you got to figure out if it makes sense for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the exercise, I'm sure Dean can get his TI 83 plus or TI 83. <laughs> <laughs> and figure out what the crossover point is. Right. Um, yeah, because to your point too, is you don't want to extend for another uh, 30. So like an option is, yeah, like you said, go for a 15 or some lenders will aff- actually offer you like a, a same term, right? And so that that's, like you said, Lane, there's options. And not to mention that there's option of just trying to pay it down quicker, <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't know if I quite believe in that. But hey, hey what's your whatever your goal is, right? Yeah, I mean, right. let's let's figure out what your goal is and if it's financial freedom, that's one thing, but if it's just paying off debt, that's another and sometimes okay. those two are not aligned. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a report from Cleveland, um heading there in a couple of weeks. Hopefully couple. it's not snowing. Um, but, you know, this is just an example of you really got to look into the submarket. I think a lot of investors that are looking to the mainland, you know, they're looking at like population growth is one of them okay. from a state okay. basis. But Cleveland is one of those places where the population is actually flatline or going down. Okay. But if you look at the inner city part, it's the downtown development that's really pushing things. Whereas the outside suburbs, you know, all the places you would buy those turnkey rentals at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 20 minutes outside the city center, that's not in high demand these days. <laughs> so it's okay. a submarket thing. And and this right. is where I think investors, I see it all the time, right? They come to our events and then they're like, what market should we get? And they're like, you know, they got like in their computer all these spreadsheets of this data that they got that's really old. Right. And they're trying to pick a market, but then they need to they need to drive down and on like which block are they going to buy? What submarket yep. are they going to buy? Like, right. And when we mean submarket, it's kind of like, you know, on the east side of Kaka'ako or yeah. the southwest side of Kaka'ako, right? And like, I mean, my understanding too is like in, in some of these areas, it, it one street over it can make a, a major difference. You know what I mean? Right, right. I mean, give me an example in Milani. I mean, Milani doesn't really have like submarkets per se. Like it should, right? It should have Uka side or kebab, I don't know. Like yeah, well, in Milan in Malka, I think there's a little bit from the standpoint of you know they the different model home types. So then, like if you go up up Kela Kela on on the on the Eva side, and it's that one hugs the hugs the ravine, or it's those are um outskirts outskirts of the Milan Malka. So those are like you know. A lot of those houses might be different from stuff on the other side of the street in terms of, um, and and they have the not to say the view, but no neighbors on on one side. So I mean that might be an example. But to to me, my understanding is on the mainland it could be more extreme, not from like you know a super high end to uh, not so high, but you you can get from middle class to like like a little bit ghetto across the street or the yeah. one block over. Especially right? like Kansas city, right? Where you and yeah. us, like it, yeah. there's like the, I think the Metro and like a few blocks away, it's like super, you're going to get shot yep. pretty much. Yeah. And even like um, Chicago too, I think is kind of similar to that too. Yeah. yeah. So to your point too, is like, yeah, you got to look at what news you're getting and what stats you're getting. Cause if it's coming from your turnkey provider or whom not or whatnot, you know, they might be biased or something or like the, the information might be old. So just make sure you're getting uh, uh, not f- fake news. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Everybody's here trying to make a buck. Just got to right. figure out when you align with somebody the right way. Yep. Uh, next headline, Cheryl Williams to develop world headquarters right where they were at in, in Cleveland again. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, for Hawaii investors or not just Hawaii people in general, we love these Las Vegas news, right? It's like, <laughs> so we were talking a lot about, I see you're all interested, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm looking where it is. Is, is it the strip? Okay. It's strip. Yeah, so this one, they're going to put in a, like a brand new 450 room luxury hotel. Okay called dream i don't know if that's really gonna be called but it's gonna be right across the mandalay bay 
and the Bali High Golf Club. So what is that? The south side of the strip? I think you're right. Yeah. yeah so it'll yeah. be one of the first hotels seen from the iconic iconic Welcome to Las Vegas sign. Hmm. I still think this is north of uh what's that that Hawaii locals? It's a locals hotel down there. Uh, I can't. Yeah, anyway. not, down, not pounds. South That's Point? Not, South Point. South oh, I've Point. never even tried there. Yeah, a lot of locals like to go there. But I think this is north of that that area. But anyway, I just bring this up because this is just an example of Class A new stock coming online. And I think two or three months we talked about, oh, what was it? The Carnival Carnival? That kind of lame hotel. It's getting <laughs> old, right? And it's, it changes hands. Yeah. And oh, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Amen. This is, and we also talked about the Bellagio also traded hands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still MGM? a nice, yeah, still a nice hotel, but it's not the top shelf one anymore. Yeah. So that's just what these, what the institutionalized guys do, and that's what um, other investors like to do. You right. Just things straight down. You you trade it and do the value add. Yeah. This RE Business reports that the NBA forecasts U.S. economy to slow in 2020. And I put this in here because I try and get both sides, you know, both bull and bearish news in here. Okay. So this one, if you're watching on the webinar, you see the numbers on the screen. But if you're tuning in on our podcast, we also do this in podcast form. Um, it has the GDP growth. And that is, it's showing like a little dip in this year and the beginning of next year but then we're right back up to 2.2 GDP growth. So this is pretty consistent on what I'm seeing in other more higher level publications, not your Fox News or CNBC or you know Wall Street Times and that kind of stuff. That a lot of people are calling for a little pause in 2020 to 2021, and then we get right back and growing in 22 and beyond. Yeah. Uh, for people looking to buy a home, I would... Uh, you're probably interested in the 10-year treasury. Uh, and then a little a little bit of education, like yesterday Dean mentioned, or a couple of days ago, they dropped the, the Fed's fund rate 50%, uh, 50% or 50% of 1%. Yeah. Wait, that doesn't make 50 basis points. Yeah, yeah, there she said, half of a percent. Yeah, so people are like, oh, that then my interest rate's going to go down. Not necessarily. So right. they they are sort of correlated but what you really want to be paying attention to is that 10 year treasury that has a lot better uh, correlation to what your interest rate is going to be paid. Mm -hmm. And this last drop, it actually did impact it. There was a, a positive correlation there. Yeah. I think a lot of it too is because you know what, what the market has built into their forecast rate. So I think this one was, this drop wasn't forecasted in, so it wasn't bid, built into the, the rates already. Yeah. Um, another pop publication, uh, Newark Knight Frank multifamily commercial or capital market report from fourth quarter 2019. They come up with these large reports and a lot of times it's mumble jumble. And this time it was a lot of mumble jumble. But I just wanted to highlight a few things from here. In terms of sales volume, they cited a strong combination of yield and growth prospects. Um <laughs> And in terms of cap rates, there was a small amount of cap rate compression, although cap rates increased 16 basis points year over year in major markets and a surge of investment activity in non-major markets caused yields to fall 12 basis points. I think those, those are just margins, just like a rounding error. I don't take exception to that. It's just a small amount. It's, yeah, the blip is so tiny. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we pointed out because novice investors will key in on stuff like that and it'll just kind of freak them out and it'll just be another excuse for them to not to do anything, which I think is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Arbor, who is a direct Fannie Mae lender and one that we use on our commercial deals because we go direct. We don't use a broker. We cut out the middleman okay. uh, and go direct to Arbor. So if you want to use our same lender, it's Arbor. Uh, so their quarter four 2019 small multifamily investment trends report, they, this is a survey. So this isn't like any kind of data. This is just like asking a bunch of dudes what they think. So they want to ask a bunch of dudes like, 
what do you guys think of the expectations for the next recession? When is it going to be? So if you, you asked them, we asked them last year, October, 2019, like 50%, almost 50% said, Oh yeah, it's going to be next year, 2020. That's the year. And it never, it's not going to happen. It's just too late already. It's not going to happen. <laughs> So this graph is kind of showing, oh, you know, it wasn't that year. It's going to be the next year, right? I mean, it's just like kind of pushing from the light green to the next one. And yeah, I put this in here because these are just kind of just pointing out, you know, this, this, I don't really look at these things, but it's just kind of interesting to point out. Everyone just wants to pick the bottom. Everybody wants to say the, the, the world is coming to an end. I was the guy who called it. <laughs> <laughs> well, recession is what that, is it, it's two quarters of um, successive falling of GDP, right? Is it ne- two, two or three quarters of negative GDP or just not? Two successive quarters is what I, um, I think is of two successive quarters negative? Of, 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 it re- of the GDP going down. Yeah. 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 So a same, same new source, Arbor, uh, different chart here. The spread between small multifamily cap rates and the 10-year treasury yields through quarter four, 2019. And this is where, this is what all, this is all the marbles right here. This is why we do what we do because people always ask like, well, what, what do you think the interest rates are going to do? What do you think the cap rates are going to do? And I'm like, I don't care because as an investor, you make your, the money you make is the difference between the cap rate and the 10 year treasury yields as what the, is depicted in this chart. And it's, it's like, it's like a timeless law. There will always be a gap between those two. Um, and then since the past like decade or even more, it's been 400 to about 500 points. So pretty consistent then. Yeah. I mean, when, when interest rates go down, so are the cap rates, Yeah, yeah. you know, Right, right, right. Oh no, the cap, the interest rates are going to go up. Well, the cap rates will likely go up, right? Kind of like it's just one of those things that just is always true. That's an interesting blip in uh, 05 to 08. That's that's uh, th- th- it changed there, right? Yeah, and I think what happened there is just yeah, it was just people just weren't buying stuff because they were scared, they're freaked or, out, <laughs> or alternative investments, yeah. maybe the stock market. Who knows, right? Well, this is in normally, I think even in a recession, if you look back and compare the same chart to other recessions, the gap between the cap rates and the 10 year was pretty consistent. Mm. You remember like 2008, that recession, that was more of a real estate issue. Right. I, I just thinking of from a standpoint of uh, moving from so a certain type of investment, say small multi-cap, multi-family, you need to take it and go somewhere else, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you might be right there. But I think... Oh, but I actually, think, I, mean, I, I think, think I'm looking at it wrong because if the spread's going down and actually people, more people are getting into it that, and that's what creates the cap rates going down because it's in inflating prices. Is that what it means? Right, right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so when, wrong, the, when the graph is going down here, that means that invest it's, it's less advantageous for investors. Yeah. 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 It's, it's squeezing it. Yeah. It's squeezing your margins. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you look at like where that, there was like a recent sort of a mini dip, that was when things weren't really that less good for investors. Mm-hmm. But, and this is, it's consistent. It's pretty dang consistent. Mm -hmm. And investors make their money on this delta and then we apply leverage, healthy leverage up to this. So we make a four times this as the yield. So, I mean, that's what investing is all about, right? It's not, it has nothing to do about interest rates. It has nothing to do about cap rates. It's the difference between the two. Oh, we're going to get a little political here. Oh, no. <laughs> so so I'm sure all you guys have so much time in the world to look what the, uh, the Trump camp is going to do with their next budget. But the um, if you want to, you can look it up at omb.gov and go through the hundreds of pages of proposals. But right now on the table they are looking to cut 5.6 billion from the department of education funding, which is a 7.8 decrease. Um, some of the negatives are eliminating staff for loans, which don't accrue interest while 
enrolling, limiting supplemental educational opportunity grants, cutting $630 million of funding to the federal work study program, reducing income driven loan repayment programs to one option, and eliminating the public loan, public service loan forgiveness program. Um, well, eliminating that, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the, it's not all bad, you know, we shouldn't all take pitchforks and knives to yeah. Capitol Hill. Well, some, I mean, even like to your point that eliminate that public service loan forgiveness program, I don't think that's very, I didn't think that was a very large program in terms of um, how many people affect. I could be wrong, but that's just a way to forgive their student loans, right? If they're working in a, I, I think, I think my wife has that. Mm-hmm. But I like try to look at it and it's so freaking hard to like apply for it and get it. I'm mm-hmm. just like, oh, it's not even worth it. Like mm-hmm. this. <laughs> well, and I, ima- I imagine it's the same for most people too. They're like, yeah. what is all this stuff you have to fill out? And there's all these yeah. rules. You know, it might be moot anyway if it's going away, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of the positives are here. It's reinstating the federal Pell Grant eligibility for short-term education programs. Hmm. Um, for some currently incarcerated students, increasing career and technical education funding by 900 million, and putting caps on graduate and parent loans with annual and lifetime limits. Parent, you know what parent plus loans are? Is that in your vocabulary? Yeah, that's um, basically you're you're tying in your your. So if you're the student, you're tying in your parents to the loan. It's exactly what it says from my, what I understand of it. Okay. Well, I was yeah. just, I was just kind of asking, I mean, I have had these. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering if they were newer. Or no, older. I think it's been around, but it, it's, um, you get some, I don't know, it's like if you can call it tax benefits, but basically now instead of a, a student loan where you're, you're in for just a student, not basically it's like them co-signing for a loan for you. Yeah. So they're on it too. So their parent plus loans for undergrad will be limited to twenty six thousand five hundred. Graduate students will be capped at five hundred thousand annually and a hundred grand total. <laughs> That's not much, man. I just did a presentation to a a, a a company locally, and we're talking about the price of tuition these days. And like, I mean, that twenty six five is. We yeah, that's not nothing. Do much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially when you're going for five years. I mean, yeah. UH is super cheap, isn't it? Like, yeah, I think, to the mainland. yeah, yeah. I think I think you're like 15k. I'm I'm not sure, but we we're, we're uh, I think I was running this scenario where if your kid is um, like nine years old and they have another eight years, and they're going to um, out of state, say the mainland, and they have out of state tuition. So talking about the the inf- inflation or how much. Um, schools have been increasing their prices annually. Um, it, you might be again a nine-year-old kid today. You might be talking about two hundred sixty-seven thousand. Yeah, for the four years, and that's just gra- undergrad. <laughs> I feel like in the last what ten to fifteen years, I feel like universities have gone up three times, whereas the price of like Midpac or Punahou has only gone up two times. Am I yeah. right there? I think to your point, the I mean. The uh, the local schools have been uh, private schools, uh, high schools, and have been going up kind of quickly too. But I think they've been catching up to the mainland and um, for high schools. But like you said, I think the the colleges have been um, increasing at a higher rate. Yeah. To your point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that mean it's a good oh. deal? No. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and that's the discussion I had with with the participant is like you know maybe. Po- forecast your ROI, right? If, if your child is going to go to, um, Harvard, which is probably now like 70 grand a year, including, um, room and board, but they're going to come back in and come back to Hawaii and, and take up a profession that starts off at 40, $50,000 a year. Yeah. You gotta, you know, how long is it going to take for them to, to pay back their loan? Right. I mean, and that's the challenge that we see for people getting out of college today is like so much debt. They can't buy a place. So, yeah. Well, discussion for a future yep. beer lab meeting or yep. 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 accredited only meeting. Yep. Join, join the main and last. Shoot me, me and Dina email. Yep. And we'll talk about whether you should go to private school or not. <laughs> Get the truth. Yeah, yep. instead of this live recorded stuff from from two guys who have experienced it, right? Yeah. So next article, tw- 
the 2020s property uh, taxes by state. Uh, this was put together by Wallet Hub. So they rank, it's kind of a cool article. Like if you want to go to Wallet Hub and play around with it, but it's like an interactive table. But it, the reason I put this on here, well, Hawaii is like the number one lowest by effective tax, effective real estate tax rate at 0.27%. Where, but the only reason it's that way because our our properties are so freaking expensive. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> you can't just look at that number alone. You gotta scroll down to that like that third column about in the state median home value. That gives a little bit better perspective, right? Yeah, like I have properties in Alabama, and they are ranked number two uh, lowest percentage. But if you look on the annual taxes on a two hundred two hundred five thousand dollar home, it's like almost double. But a $205,000 home, I mean, that's an A minus class property. That would be like $1.5 million here for sure. <laughs> like at least. <laughs> Maybe, yep. yeah, at least. And you even mentioned lot size too, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I was looking at some houses that I want to live in, Dean. Like okay. if I would have still lived in the mainland, like some things mm-hmm. I was actually would consider living in in 10, okay. 20 years. Okay. If I would have bought that here in Hawaii, it'd be like four to six million dollars. Something that would cost me like a million, million and a half on the mainland. It's crazy. Well, you have your go-to realtor, so let me know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think we had some bad news a lot, so I just want to end it with some good news and. Uh, CNBC reports that the U.S. is experiencing the longest economic expansion on record, best in the period from 1991 to 2001. Wow. I'm sure the, there's some guy out there drinking a beer and saying, well, it's going to come down any day. <laughs> but you, that you could also be the guy who misses out on the four, five, six best years yet right. to come. Right, right. Um, New, York, New, York, New York Times says the decade-long U.S. expansion has generated 200 million jobs. Market Watch says 3.4% year-over-year wage growth is the strongest in more than a decade. Yahoo Finance says January 2020 had record job growth in the private sector. sector. Yeah, um, and then the WhiteHouse.gov says, of course, they're gonna toot their horn. The <laughs> lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have a job. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> it's just, everyone's got jobs these days, you right. know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Deloitte. Uh, we, let's talk about this a little bit, Dean. So Deloitte yeah. came up with this study of personal savings, a look at how Americans are saving. And so what they did here is they we're showing for for those guys who are in the podcast form. You guys can check this out on YouTube. It's kind of a cool graph but it graphs like the top 20 percentile wage earners yeah. and the rest, the 60 to 80 percentiles, the 40 to 60%, the 20 to 40, and then the below. So it's saying that back like five, eight years ago, we hit a little peak and you can see it in the top 20 percentile people. They were saving a lot of money and then they, it dropped a little bit and mm-hmm. I've read books on this. It's called The Great Forgetting. They say every 8 to 15, 12 years, they say people forget how things were. They forgot about the recession. And Mm. this is just the ebb and flow of life. (laughs) I get get that forgetting thing because, I mean, it seems like our, our parents don't forget though, right? Because they say that's why the older generations are stocking stockpiling the toilet paper in the waters because you know back in your day you know when things ran out for whatever reason war or um the shipping companies stopped coming then you know you're you're stuck so i think some generations don't forget though <laughs> yeah but you know from like a who spends the money thing, uh-huh. i don't care about them i care about you dean right right, right. like you got all this youtube stuff you don't care you forgot what happened five years ago yep Right. Last week. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Different a, generations. Different generations. Yeah. yeah. And um, another unfortunate takeaway, you know, for the people who are in 50 percentile or less, they're barely saving any money. Yeah. yeah. Paycheck and, uh, to paycheck. Yeah. And that's, that's how financial freedom is obtained. You take the 
the area under this curve and you invest it so you put it into more investments that build cash flow right not necessarily pay off debt this is a big difference Oh, you're not pitching Dave Ramsey then? No, I'm not pitching <laughs> Dave Ramsey. Like I no. believe I believe the people who are in the top in the below 20 percentile and the 20 to 40 percentile, people with consumer debt, yeah, you need to figure out how to get your finances in order. Right. And Dave yeah. Ramsey, Susan Orman are great resources for that. Right. Yeah. But for and the- yeah, to your point too is to to each their own because if you don't have that large nest egg, then for me, like for me, I, I don't come from old money, so I need to use smart leverage, right? And to your point, Lane, I'm gonna save what I can and I'm gonna invest it in things that generate income, and the leverage is just a multiplier on top of that. So I have to do smart leverage versus like Dave Ramsey says, pay, pay off all your debt, right? But I I think smart leverage is needed for for people in the right situation yeah well, yeah when i hang out at your four million dollar house it's your strategy will change it'll turn right. more into capital preservation preservation you, exactly right as you get past this this point called critical mass where you have enough money and yep. you can just live off the the rest right 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 exactly but until then we keep doing real estate brothers and um i did a bunch of articles and podcasts this past month you guys can take a look at it here and uh, this is the kind of the time of the show where we ask people who are on live if they have any questions oh here is a dean helped me out at this uh we did a hui three we called it so i brought all my investors from the mainland that was so fun that was awesome man I, i really enjoyed it that was super cool yeah it was fun yeah yeah it was fun yeah. Not it's not often you get a bunch of like highly affluent people who when they come to Hawaii they all stay in uh cheap hotels because they want their frugal and they want to save money. Yep. And just like to your point too, just being around a, a different um b- bunch of people is, is always good fun, right? Everyone's thinking different. You had some great minds in that group, right? And great great activities too. We had some real fun activities. Yeah, you gave you gave your heartfelt uh, confessional about how you uh, your son's popping in there. Yeah, to get <laughs> yeah. A screen time. Right. So, but yeah, I mean that was that was great. Thank you for the opportunity to participate, and I had fun in the activities that I could join in. Because to your point, it's the it's the full experience, right? It's not just coming to that that seminar on Monday and and talking, go, going through all those social activities with everyone. It, it made it so much better when we actually sat down on for that day of seminar so like um more in touch with the people that i was talking to more willing to share so i i, I really enjoyed it dude. i told you man it was all designed that way yep. i told you i had yep. a vision that that, that vision was great and you executed excellently thank you so, thanks for the dude, help yeah i know so, so yeah listeners man next time lean has we have one of those things i definitely suggest you come come out and and have fun with us because have fun and you're learning. It's, it's great. Yeah. And not too many Hawaii people came. Yep. And it's, and I think that's, it's cooler when people like fly out to somewhere and, and cause they're in, they're in their like swimwear. They're, yep. they're drinking at the Kool-Aid and the potential tax benefits of, of the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, no, I mean, you're, 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 we had so many people from different uh, walks of life, right? And you had the, computer programmers you had the scientists you had the engineers it was that i think was very interesting you had the cpas and and when we had the the, the mastermind discussion everyone's talking and everyone's putting in their two cents and their value add and i um, not scaring to share i think um it's one of the most powerful things about you know masterminds in general yeah yeah not yeah. many things in life you remember but that would yeah. be something i'd remember for sure for sure so I, my lessons learned this month, I read that book, Willpower Doesn't Work. I would suggest that one, Dean. Yeah, I, I took a look at that one too. Um, it's, it's good, um, especially, I think we talked about it the other episode, right? Where it's like, you, you, you can't, the, your willpower is not strong, so you have to physically take out the, the diversions, right? Right. Yeah, uh, you have to create so. systems because you just have to understand that willpower. You're not going to, what do they call it? White knuckle. You can't white knuckle your way through yep. 
everything. Right, right. So this, the book has a whole bunch of strategies. And um, I actually, when I listen to the book like that, I don't listen to it at two or three X speed. I actually listen to it one X speed so I can like <laughs> think of other action items to do based yeah. on what they're talking about. The library has that one too. Um, I borrowed that one for the library. And um, the next book I'm going to read is this Go-Giver. And I am opening up a book club because I got nothing better to do these days. <laughs> but we're only going to read like a book every two months. It's a slow book club. Okay, that's so, doable. Yeah, so you can go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash lanehack. And every couple of months, we'll get on a call like this. But everybody will see each other and be able to have a nice discussion online. Um, no pants required. And uh, we'll talk about this book. I think I got it scheduled for April 25th. So if you want to get in now and start reading it, you've got a quite a while. Oh, that's doable. So, yeah. It's uh, free 99. And um, you just got to read the book. <laughs> no cliff notes, huh? No cliff yeah, notes cheating. No, no cliff notes. No cliff notes on that one. <laughs> Let me see if we got some questions here. Oh, we got we got a few. I I got one popping up. Can you see that one from uh, Mr. Chang over there? Um, are you on the Facebook part? Yeah. So he's he said um. And while it's unfortunate that the COVID-19 made the market crash, we're looking forward to our home ownership in 2021. Can you predict what the interest rate will be? <laughs> wow. Yeah, Jeffrey. well, I had a slide, right? Right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what the MBA forecasts. That's better than what I would have, so. <laughs> can, can you see this, Dean? Can you get bigger? It's still in, um, it's not in presentation mode. There it is. Hopefully you can read that. So I, how, the way I would read this is I would just look at it, like take the 2019 baseline at 1.8 and then it's going to go up a little bit and then it'll just climb very slightly, maybe 10% higher, which if the interest rate is 3%, man, it's like 3.3. Who cares, right? right? I mean, like I said, if you're buying an asset that actually produces, you know, in income, which is a cap, what a cap rate essentially is, mm -hmm. who cares what the interest rates are because the cap rates will go up. Right. But yeah, I see it. You know, if you're buying a house to live in that you're going to just camp out and for 30 then, years. Yeah. Then you're just reducing buying power. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, but I wouldn't freak out in terms of like what's, what's, what the interest rate is doing. Yeah. I mean, it's all time lows right now. Yeah. So many factors to, to say, you know, in a, two years from now, right? It's got the p political factors, it's got the race coming up end of the year. Yeah. So, so many different factors. But we got, a, um, we got three more questions here, and I okay. gotta, I gotta head to the CrossFit gym at seven. Okay, okay, so okay. We gotta, we gotta run through this. Does the internet interest rates going down affect the HELOC rates? You wanna take that one? Um. So, in what I've typically seen in a I'm not the banker guy, but what I've typically seen is I think it, it will, yes, but HELOC rates seem to adjust um, a little slower. And the reason why that is, is um, a lot of times the, the banks are offering these promotional rates, right? So you see these big signs and, and to me over these past, I don't know how many years now, it's, it's always been kind of around the local financial institutions, you know, say like 1% if you're one year lock, 2% for two year lock, 3% for three year lock around there. And then now they're off, they're changing their products. Now they're offering, you know, like close to a little under 5% for like the five year lock. So, and then it's what changes is the, um, after that promotional rate, what the, um, what the, the, it'll reset to. So that, that rate changes, but the, the promotional rates, don't seem to change as quickly as um, on the 30 year mortgage. And I think they're, they're promoting these, um, these products that way, but what does change the underlying, um, the way that these HELOCs are written up is when it does reset after your promotional rate, it's going to be tied into either prime or, or, or something with the current rate is at the time of reset. So um, 
yeah, that's what I've seen and that's my experience. Yeah, and exactly what Dean says, they're teasers because here in Hawaii, there's not as many like banking products because the banks are really conservative here. Mm-hmm. So instead of like five, six different random like lending products, all we got here in Hawaii is like the HELOC. That's all we got. Mm-hmm. So it's they're trying to tease you to get into their banking system and they're willing to cut their, their profit margin to get you in the door because they know with... Um, you know, banking clients, once you get them in the door, they typically stay. So right. it's kind of like, you know, like Uber giving $50 off a first ride kind of yeah. a thing. Well, then like to your point too, they're hoping to get other business, right? Like the, your, your banking, your checking, maybe your, your business or maybe your kid's loan or, or their peripheral products. Like, uh, there I go there, but like, you know, five to nines or, yeah. or personal, uh, banking or financial advising, um, you know, they're trying to get all of your, your business, not just the HELOC. So um, getting a HELOC, a lot of people will try to use it to do their, um, using that money, f- you know, to sweep money back and forth. So then you need another account, right? Your, your regular checking or savings. So then they'll get you with these other products. Not get you uh, from a negative standpoint, but get you from the standpoint of your business, yeah, and and if you're like Dean, who's a cold, heartless numbers guy who has no allegiance to one bank or another and just goes after the lowest rate, we have the uh, cheat sheet at reiloha.com slash HELOC with all the teaser rates for all the banks and a little cheat sheet on how what's the most effective way to hop from them and uh, not pay any fees. So... Uh, very common, very common. Yeah, everyone's trying to be, uh, it's like your guy with the little um, the plug outlet thing. Everyone's a little like do it yourself, all right? This is how right. I do it. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. paint my house. I do this type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wherever you provide value, right? If the, yeah. Uh, next question, what do you think of investors from the mainland who are investing in Hawaii? Do you see any of those guys competing with you? Investors? Um... Yes. What do I think about them? I mean, it's just are they overpaying or how do no. they bid or no, no. I, um, I mean, the market's a market. Wherever you go, if you go in the mainland, there's local guys there that I'm I'm the out of state guy competing against them. So, um, I mean, I don't view them as anything specific. Um, I mean, you know, back in the '80s, we had the the Japanese investors driving up um, prices, right and and now you don't see that as much. We had, you know, theoretically there were like Chinese investors, not only here, but all over the world. And then, then I think, I don't know if it's true, but the Chinese government was trying to stop the uh, monies from going out of China. So they started to put like caps and regulation. But I mean, the market is the market, right? And so if you're investing in Hawaii on Oahu, I mean, you always talk about about the full the spectrum of investing right one side you have cash flow and on the far other side you're going to have um, appreciation so depending on what your long-term goal is it's going to determine where you invest and what you're investing in whether it be cash flow or um, appreciation for wealth preservation but if so typically if you're investing in hawaii you know san fran new york you're it's probably not going to look very good on the cash flow side compared to other places, right? Lane, like, like Alabama, Texas, uh, KC, Indy, right. whatnot. So, I mean, I don't look at them um, in any way besides, uh, you know, I'm putting in my offer. I'm, I don't know what the other uh, competition is that's putting in their uh, submitting their offer. So at the end of the day, it's just, are the numbers working for me? And um, I mean, like you said, you can look at it at the macro level to see like, is a lot of money coming in from uh, foreign places and is that driving up our market? Um, and try to do that macro analysis, like how we talk about on, on, on your side, your half of the podcast and stuff. But I mean, at the end of the day is do the numbers work, right? Because, you know, you talk about real, pro- real property taxes and percentage of um, the, the value of your home, but at the, bo- the end of the day, it's the bottom line. What's, what's the net cash on cash return, uh, forecasted appreciation, vacancy, all, all those numbers play in. What is your, your bottom line? So I don't know. Hope that answers their question. But I, 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 I we look at the information, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's the same anywhere. I mean, when we when we get outbid, like investing in an Alabama, and we look and it's some random group from California, we just kind of like, you know, hit our That's head against of- the wall. Uh-huh. I mean, it's kind of like when, uh, you know, like the opposing pitcher hits a home run off, off of you uh-huh. in the National League. <laughs> I'm just kind of like, all right, whatever, you know, and that's just like, it happens. Goes to sh- yeah, it just happens. And yeah, yeah. more than likely, you know, some mainland person, they don't know the sub markets and they just, right. they're just a sucker or buyer and right. just, that's what you have to deal with and you just got to remain consistent. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so the last question here, will we get killed in the near term when tourism drops off and how long does it take for the islands to recover? Is term going going down? I don't know. I don't pay attention. Uh, I just spoke to someone that worked in the hotel industry last week, and they're telling me that um, occupancy rates were again. This is um, anecdotal information. This is not from DBED or anything, but he was telling me their hotel that he was working at occupancy rates were in the low 80s. And I think around this time of year, they're typically more in the 90s. So I think we're feel it, starting to feel it. I mean, the their airlines are definitely feeling it, right? I mean, they're already, the Asia and Europe, they're stopping um, flying for in different um Air, yeah, I got, I got a sad email from Alaskan Airlines CEO saying, that not, don't worry about the coronavirus. Uh, I think, didn't, was it Amazon in Seattle? Didn't they, they say if you don't have to fly, um, uh, postpone any uh, non-necessary? Oh, it's Facebook, um, right? Yeah, I know Facebook. Was it Facebook? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. after Washington State, right, they're having the um, fatalities going up. So I think it's yeah in the Seattle area too. So, I mean, I think we're already seeing it in terms of um, it hurting. Um, uh, that's hard to say. When when will we recover? I mean, tourism industry. I mean, yeah, that's tough. I I, I like to think that our with our uh, medical technology being so um, advanced that um, and and our government governments internationally being so proactive and and no one wants to see a recession that everyone's working hand in hand to make sure that you know this is going to be i'm thinking like it'll just total guesstimate is like you know in maybe a month we'll have a handle and and contain it and maybe it'll peak but total guesstimate i ha- i don't have a crystal ball i i don't claim to be nostradamus but i don't know lane what is your take so you don't think that the Chinese made this virus five years ago and now they're trying to cash in on the uh, vaccine that they already have? <laughs> I, I shoot, I, I, I don't no. know. But I, I don't know if maybe you got to go look at the, um, the day traders and see who's, who's making the big, uh, shorting the market big time f- from, from China and then maybe then we'll get our answer right. I don't know. I invest in stable blue collar markets where right. there's steady growth and population growth. Right. I got nothing in Hawaii. I just live here. So to your point, then you don't care what happens on care. the short term. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. I don't yep. care. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you don't think they made that virus? No. <laughs> Oh, these conspiracy theories, yeah. I tell you. Uh, I got a lot of things, a lot of time to think about some of this. Well, stuff. I'm curious about the North Korea one, man. If, if they're actually doing that to that, that one is, I don't know how far fetched that is, right? Just kill off the, the people with, with the disease. Yeah, and, that, that's a total propaganda thing to say, right? We don't have any coronavirus here. We're, yeah. we're too healthy, right? But hey, maybe <laughs> he's saying the truth because if you just get rid of the, the bug, the people with it, I mean, that's sad not to laugh at it, but in you know not putting it past it him but um it could could be happening right yeah i don't know maybe he's a nice guy i don't know, I don't know. yeah that's true you know we don't know <laughs> yeah, dennis rodman hangs out with him right yeah yeah <laughs> all right guys well we've gone uh five minutes too long so we will see you guys next month and um before you guys go make sure and check um go to our events section com slash uh meetings or events and check out our seminar that we're going to try and put together on may 2nd so it'll be a half day event and you guys can learn all about uh, getting to financial freedom and how do you buy a rental property and we'll walk you through that all right we'll talk to you guys later bye bye
3 Real Estate Investing Group, check out reialoha.com. Just two local guys with so much to say. So listen to the real estate brothers today.